Mary Magdalene interviews Jesus on the subject of Mormon religion. Questions from Caroline Brock. This is session four. The interview took place in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia, on the 25th of September, 2012. Okay, we're up to part four of our um, interview on Mormonism yeah. with Jesus. and On the Mormon religion, shall we call it? Yeah, let's say that, mm. on the Mormon religion. But yeah. obviously our discussions thus far have encompassed a lot of other, other religious faiths. Other religious faiths yes. and truths that affect a lot of other religious faiths. Yes. But I am today um, just conveying some more questions that have come from Caroline Brock in the United States. She commenced this series with you, so I'm mm. just finishing it off with you, yep. and then we'll do some mediumship with some of the spirits who have been interested in our discussions. Yes. Okay. Quite a lot of spirits interested in our discussions. Yeah. Some of them not too happy, but they're not of the Mormon religion. <laughs> yeah, interestingly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right. Um, Mormons define a prophet as one who talks directly to God. Mm -hmm. In Amos 3.7, it says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Mm -hmm. Mormons firmly believe that we have a living prophet today who talks with Christ and guides our church. Mm -hmm. In your earlier interview, you stated that Joseph Smith was a prophet, mm -hmm. much like other prophets from the Bible, mm -hmm. but that he did not speak, he did not speak directly with God. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of a prophet? A definition of a prophet is a person who speaks with any spirit. So you could say that every single person who channels spirits or does mediumship with spirits or who proph prophesies in the church, they are all just talking to different spirits and relaying the messages of those particular spirits to people on earth. And they are what I would classify as a prophet. <laughs> so. Uh could you say anyone who is a spirit medium is also a prophet? Yes. And can then a spirit medium or a prophet, this is my question now, channel God directly? Um, a, a person on earth can channel God directly if they are at one with God. If they are not at one with God, they don't have an ability to channel God directly because they are not connected with God enough or connected with God's emotions enough to be able to do so. They can partially channel some information about God or, or, or so forth through spirits. So spirits can receive information from God and then give that information to a person, which often does occur, actually. Um, but, but the person themselves on earth, unless they are at one with God, they, haven't, they are not able to channel God directly. Okay. Several prophets in the Old Testament describe visions where they saw God sitting on a throne. Can you explain what they were seeing? They were being given images from spirits about the spirit's concept about God. So the spirit had a conception about God uh, uh, that they then put into images that they then relayed through the process of mediumship or prophecy to the person on earth. And then the person on earth wrote down these images that they either saw themselves through this relay or that they were described to them verbally from the spirit. And so this, the person on earth was just like a scribe, if you like, uh, for the information that was being transmitted to them. And as pictures uh, or movies, as well as sound. And why would God have been depicted sitting on a throne by such spirit? Well, those spirits had a certain concept of God at the time. And as a result of their concept of God, they wanted to relay that concept of God to the earth. Now, oftentimes, that was the way that people on earth grew in their concept of God. Before then, the concepts of God were some kind of raging maniac uh, who was going to destroy anybody who, who did anything wrong. And, uh, and as these other images came through prophetic writings, through the spirit mediumistic process to the earth, then the concept of God began to change. And the beauty of that was that the, the concept of God began to change so much that by the time I came onto the earth, I could actually realize the true concept of God. Mm. Okay. Um, has anyone ever directly communicated with God? You covered this a little earlier. Well, every time we receive divine love from God, we are directly communicating with God. 
So any person who is in any, any place in the spirit world and any place on earth is, has the ability to receive divine love from God under certain circumstances and conditions. And while they're receiving divine love from God, they are communicating with God in that moment. The question is whether we're having a permanent communication with God or not. Well, that, that is not possible until you're at one with God, to have a permanent communication with God. Um, what about when we pray? Are we in direct communication with God? Yes. Um, our feelings, remember prayer is a soul-based emotion that we feel towards God. If we define prayer as that rather than just words that we are speaking, and then yes, we are in direct communication with God. God's heart is open to such communication and receives instantly the communication, even though God exists outside of the universe in which we live. He automatically receives those communications. And in fact, any feeling-based communication is automatically received by God's soul. And if I was to receive an answer back from God, how would that happen? Is that possible? It is possible, but only again as a feeling. Um, not as a thought or words. If there are words or thoughts being appearing as a result of the, of the communication, then a spirit intermediary is being used. And sometimes the spirit may not be in very good condition. So unfortunately, sometimes the intermediary can actually tell us the fa a false thing, completely disharmony with what God actually feels. And so to clarify, if I'm receiving a message from God, it would never be in words and only in feelings? Yes, a message from God is never in words, ever in words. So if we believe we are hearing God saying certain things to us, we are not hearing God, we are hearing a spirit who is masquerading as God. Now, there are many spirits in the spirit world who believe themselves to be God. Uh, they have so much arrogance that they believe themselves to be God. Um, and of course, they often masquerade as God because they don't believe there's anything wrong with that. There are other spirits who masquerade as God and who know they are not God, but they masquerade as God in order to cause much trouble on earth, you know, to give people messages in their mind to go and do things that are damaging. So this is why many people who, you know, have, have an instant desire to murder, say, God told me to do it or something okay. like that. You see many religious people who have a tendency towards violence have that kind of feeling where they feel that God's telling them to do something like that. This is not God, and it's also not a spirit in a very good condition but rather a spirit who's in a very dark condition, who is very unloving and who wishes to perpetrate more violence on the earth and use the person's beliefs about God to do so. Mm -hmm. okay. We believe, this is Caroline's question, we believe that Christ is Jehovah mm -hmm. and was the God of the Old Testament and that Jehovah was the creator of this earth. Can you explain your beliefs regarding these things? Well, Jehovah is the modern day form of the name Yahweh. And that is the name that we used for God in the first century in the Jewish faith. So Jehovah, we refer to Jehovah or Yahweh as the creator of the heaven and the earth. In other words, our true father. Okay. And, uh, and we didn't, the Jewish faith didn't have a good concept of Jehovah. You know, Jehovah was a very punishing, wrathful, angry God as well as a very considerate and loving God, depending on what we did. You know, if we did everything God wanted, then Jehovah would benefit, you know, our relationship with Jehovah would benefit us. If we did everything that uh, God did not want, then our relationship with Yahweh would not benefit us. And we often felt like we were being punished or attacked for uh, the relationship. That's how many people in the first century felt. However, Jehovah or Yahweh, the creator of the heaven and the earth, as we refer to them in the, in the Jewish faith and, and, and in, the, the, um, the, in, in all aspects of our Jewish religious faith, um, that is not Christ. Christ is, uh, the process, is a process of being receiving divine love until the point of becoming at one with God. And once you become at one with God, you could be said to be Christed. And you become, and the very first person to do that, who was myself in the first century, become the first Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was often referred to as Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, Christ meaning that God and I myself had entered a relationship to the point where I developed myself in love enough to, and received enough divine love from God to become at one with God or Christ it. And therefore Christ is not the same as God. And uh, in fact, very, very different. Um, the very first Christ, myself, 
uh, on this planet, and I'm not the very first Christ on any planet, I'm just the very first Christ on this planet, um, is not God and will never be God. Mm -hmm as the first Christ on any planet would not be God, nor will, it, uh, uh, nor will God ever be them. Mm -hmm. The reality is we are um, a, a different entity to God, but we become at one with God through by becoming at one with the way God feels and acts and thinks about matters with regard to love. And this is the process of becoming Christed. Mm -hmm. So for the Mormon religious faith and many other faiths, um, there is this amalgamation of God and myself. They believe that Jesus has, is God. This is, a, this is not correct. Um, I, was not, I am not Jehovah. I am not Yahweh. I am not the original creator of the, what, I, what we called in the Bible the heavens and the earth, what I would call the universe. Um, we are, I am not the original creator of that. I am just a person, just the same as any other person on this planet is a person. And I have the same abilities and, and possibilities as any other person on the planet. Um, Jehovah, Yahweh, the true God, the creator, if you use any of those terms for God, is the real God of the universe and is the creator of me. And therefore, I can never be and will never be the same person as God. Mm. So in answer to the question, Christ is not God. Christ is a process through which a person receives enough of God's love to become divine in their nature and to actually finish up agreeing with God's love and how God's love is exercised. They still have their independent will. They still can exercise their will and desires and passions but they will exercise their will in harmony with the love that they've received to a point of perfection. They, they will always be perfect in the way in which they exercise their love. It does not mean either that they know everything because knowing things is a gradual process that we grow in. And even after we become at one with God, we do not automatically know everything. Mm. Knowing things is a result of learning and learning is a process that occurs over time. And we can't expect to ever know instantly anything. If a person on earth does instantly know something, it's because generally they are being overcloaked by a spirit or being told by a spirit that particular thing. Sure. Mm. Okay. Have you then, Jesus, ever spoken to or appeared to any of our prophets or apostles in the past 170 years? Well, yes, I have spoken to people on earth before I came back to earth again. And I still speak to people on earth, even though I am on earth um, through the same kind of processes that I used before I came to earth. However, most of the people that I've spoken to on earth are not famous people. They're not leaders of religions. They are not people um, who generally have a position in any church or any position of favour. I have in the past spoken to people at different times who became religious leaders of a kind. So for example, people like Luther, I did speak with in his early years and, and, and influenced quite a lot in his early years. However, as time, occur, time proceeds on the planet, generally people who receive positions of power or responsibility become distorted in the way in which they exercise that responsibility or power. And as a result of that, I, I cannot connect with them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so therefore there is a disconnection. So by the time they become well known on earth, generally I don't have any communication with them. There are many thousands of people on earth that I've communicated with over the two, last two millennia. And uh, many of those people though are not people who are well known. Uh, and we've only established a connection because of their desire for truth and their desire for truth about God and their truth about the relationship with God and, and other truths that we were trying or attempting to give to people on earth. So I used to love and still love, enjoy and enjoy speaking with people who have a desire for truth. Mm. Those particular people who have a desire for truth aren't always famous people. And in fact, many times the famous people have less of a desire for truth than the people who are just the grassroots people of the planet, which, and by the way, um, I don't see any difference between a person who is famous and a person who is not famous. So there is no reason why I would go to a person who is famous, like the Pope, for example, and mm -hmm. speak with him, whether I'm on earth or in the spirit world, 
in comparison to going to a person who's a, who is a, who's a Catholic that's unknown by the Pope, but who has a desire to understand more about love and have a closer relationship with God. I would prefer to speak to that person than the Pope. Mm. Mm. Now, some Popes have had a different attitude and therefore a more open attitude to being talking to Jesus. And so you would definitely, I would definitely appear to them. So, so uh, there is no sort of delineation except the delineation of desire. So on, on earth, people here have this viewpoint that something, you know, it's to do with the power or the responsibility or how well known they are, or how famous they are as to what attention they'll receive from the spirit world. In the spirit world, in the highest spheres of the spirit world, these kind of things do not matter at all. And are not, they don't govern our actions mm -hmm. in any way. Mm -hmm. The Bible has many prophecies in the Old Testament regarding a Messiah that would come. Mm -hmm. Were these true prophecies? Well, the prophecies that came true were true prophecies and the prophecies that didn't come true were not. <laughs> we need to understand how prophecies are made. And prophecies are made through the process of relaying of information from the spirit world through a medium here on earth or a prophet here on earth to a written word. Generally, that's how all prophecies are made. Bearing that in mind, some of the people on earth are not in the condition to receive everything that they're hearing, and so there is a distortion of what they're hearing. Um, also, some of the spirits in the spirit world who relay such information are not in the condition to relay information accurately. They distort the information based on their own belief systems, so sometimes the information they transmit is not accurate either. Mm -hmm. They're still a prophet. The person on earth is still a prophet, but it doesn't necessarily mean the prophecy is accurate. There were a lot of prophecies given, not only in the Hebrew scriptures of the Bible, but in many other religious forms, uh, you know, Hindu and Buddhist and other types of forms, all around the world given about the coming of a Messiah. All of these prophecies were true. There was the coming of a Messiah, but, but the Messiah had to recognise the role and the Messiah had to go through a process with God to discover how to become at one with God. And the Messiah had to realise that through a process that, that, that God had already previously designed. So, that, so it wasn't anything that Messiah was discovering, aside from discovering something about God. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something the Messiah came up with on his own back. It was something that God influenced through this process. Now, that being the case, there are many things in the Bible that are prophecies of, that you could call messianic in nature. In other words, they refer to the coming of myself. There are other prophecies that refer to the coming of the Messiah as a warrior king. Mm -hmm. And those were not true. And to be frank, will never be true because the man who was the Messiah didn't want to be a warrior king. <laughs> and so they can never come true. And it's interesting when you think about it, that many of the religious people of the first century wanted the Messiah to be a king and a warrior. And it's interesting that many Christians today want the Messiah coming again to be a king and a warrior. And it's interesting, I find, that in 2,000 years, the general desire of many of the people who believe such things hasn't changed, mm. even though I proved in the first century that I did not want to be a king or a warrior. Mm -hmm. So I doubt whether my position on that is going to change. So at some point, hopefully theirs will. Mm. But, the, but we need to understand that there were many prophecies given from the spirit world to earth about the coming of a person who would introduce people to the process of how to become at one with God. Mm. Mm. Okay. And that has been the case in every planet, actually, that has human habitation. That there, that there are messiahs, there is a messiah. There are messiahs in every one of those planets, that, and every one of those planets had a person who embraced that role just a similar way to the way I've embraced that role. And, uh, and they became the first person on that planet to become at one with God. And they demonstrated through their condition what at one with God actually meant. So basically, to recap that last question, there were prophecies in the Old Testament that foretold your coming as a Messiah in the first century. Mm -hmm. And how that would occur. And, and how that would occur. And mm -hmm. Some were accurate, some were not. Mm -hmm. But essentially, you are the Messiah f for Earth. <laughs> Um, yes, yes. As is the case now? As is the case, well, the Messiah is the first person to become at one with God. That's the person who finishes up teaching the other people how to become mm -hmm. at one with God. 
just mm-hmm. like just like the very first person who discovered something else on the planet is always going to be the very first person who discovered that particular thing. So there's only ever one. There's only ever the first, mm-hmm. uh, but there's not only ever one. You know, there are very, very many people who have now become Christ, who have now become people who are at one with God. There are many millions of those. Uh, and, and in fact, every single person on this planet has the ability to become Christ or become Christed. So, you know, I'm not unique. I'm just the first one. Mm-hmm. That's all. It's like, it's like the first person who ever, flew, who ever made or built and flew a plane. Uh, they are always going to be the first one on this planet. Mm-hmm. But, but there's now millions of them who do that. Yes. You know, so we all now enjoy what they discovered. We, and we don't go, oh, they're saying they're better than us. We, we go instead, we go, oh, isn't it wonderful that they created that particular thing that we can now use? Yeah. So I'm not saying to anybody that I'm better than them. I'm just saying, isn't it wonderful that somebody came along who discovered something that we can all use? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, in part two of this series of interviews that we've been doing, mm-hmm. the Mormon temple endowment was discussed. Mm-hmm. One of the main things Mormons receive in this endowment is power in the priesthood. You spoke about the idea that power in the priesthood is actually power from pe- priesthood spirits mm-hmm. in the spirit world and not power directly from God. Mm-hmm. If this is the case and Mormons are receiving priesthood power to help strengthen and guide them on earth, is there anything inherently wrong about this? Well, it depends about how the power is exercised. Um, The problem with power exercised on this planet presently is that most power exercised on the planet is distorted. It becomes distorted because the person in power wishes or desires to manipulate or control others through the exercise of their power. So this is a distorted use of power. In the spirit world, such distorted uses of power do not exist in the higher spheres. So our only use of power in the higher spheres of the spirit world are all around love. They all surround the underlying principles of love. Power is only used in harmony with love. And, uh, and this is something, a concept that is not well understood here on the planet. As a result of that, in most religions, priestly power exercised on the planet is unfortunately often distorted. Now, it doesn't have to be such. It doesn't have to be so. But unfortunately, because of the unhealed human condition, it becomes so. Now, if a priest in the spirit world exercises his power in an unloving manner, in other words, he uses it to punish somebody on earth, or he uses it to harm somebody on earth, or he selectively protects people on earth, In other words, he only protects people who accept his doctrines or principles and he attacks people who do not. Then he is using his power in a very distorted manner. And of course, that is a sin from God's perspective or it is a missing of the mark of love from God's perspective. There are also penalties on the soul of a person acting in that manner, not by God, but through the law. So whenever we break a law of love, there's automatic penalties that occur on our soul as as a result of the breaking of the law. These penalties are mostly painful in their, in their actions and they're very similar to when we put our hand on a fire uh, in terms of pain. So when we act in a manner that's out of harmony with some kind of principle of love, there is an automatic pain that occurs in the soul whether we're sensitive to it or not. So many of the uh, priesthood in the spirit world, and this applies to priesthood of all religious forms, not just the Mormon religion, they are exercising they are exercising and still exercising their power in an unloving manner and their own personal condition is degrading as a result if they exercise their power and position in a loving manner their own personal position and condition will grow in love they will they will have the benefits of that but it depends totally upon the motive and the underlying inclination that comes from the heart of the individual as to what they are doing that causes their condition to either grow or degrade. Mm. It is not a process of being sort of approved of by God or not approved of God. It's basically a process of where they themselves have either brought themselves in harmony or out of harmony with love. Mm. And that is the only reason why a person should ever exercise any power in harmony with love. Now, there are many people in the spirit world who have learned to exercise power in harmony with love, and of course, God gives them more power. 
there are many persons in the spirit world who attempt to exercise their power out of harmony with love and of course that results in the taking away of their power. Mm. So then um, in relation to this question, if there are spirits, um, priesthood spirits, giving uh, power or giving feelings, giving um, protection and guidance to priests on earth and they're doing this in harmony with love, there's the, from what you're saying, there's nothing wrong with that. There can only be positive things. There can only be positive benefits from that. Mm. Yeah. But if they're doing it in a way that's in disharmony with love or ignoring certain truths... Yes, if they're teaching untruths that the person on earth will have to unfortunately release from themselves at some point in the future, then that is very damaging to the person on earth. And of course there will be a penalty associated with that to the spirit in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And the penalty isn't a punishment by God, it's an automatic thing that happens to the soul when the soul acts out of harmony with love and truth. Mm. Mm. Okay, um, will priesthood spirits in the spirit world who are helping further Mormonism on earth have to repent even if they sincerely thought they were doing God's will? Um, it's not a measure of sincerity, it's a measure of love. So if they lovingly were doing what they were doing in the spirit world and they were being loving to every single person on earth, not just to people in the Mormon faith, then there is nothing for which to repent aside from teaching an untruth, which can easily be corrected. If, however, they were acting in an unloving manner towards either other Mormons on earth or other people on earth, and they were prejudicial in the way in which they displayed their love, then they will need to repent for far more things other than just speaking untruth. Mm. It all depends upon how much unloving behaviour there has been, how much violent reactions there has been in the spirit world towards the people on earth and towards each other in the spirit world as to what kind of corrections will need to occur. Any time we're out of harmony with love, at some point in the future, we will have to repent for it. Yeah, I suppose um, some of the feelings of these spirits is that they've actually assisted to bring, because there is some truth in the Mormon faith, that they've, ex they've assisted to bring truth to the planet. Is this true? Yes, but they've also assisted bringing falsehood to the planet through the t same teachings. So they would need to take steps to correct the falsehood. And if they were sincere in their desire to love and their desire for truth, then they would take those positive steps to correct the falsehood. They wouldn't do it in a punishing manner or a controlling manner, but they would definitely take positive steps to deliver more truth to the planet. One thing I love about the Mormon religion is that there is an openness to spirit communication. This is very, very uh, unusual on the planet with most Christian faiths. Most Christian faiths have a deep resistance to communicating with spirits because they take the uh, Old Testament viewpoint of communication with spirits. Ironically, when I was in the first century, I spoke to both uh, very dark spirits and also to very bright spirits. And there is a complete record in the Bible of my doing so. Unfortunately, because people then view me as God, they thought, think I should get away with it. Um, and they don't apply it to themselves, that they are allowed to speak to spirits, both positive and negative spirits, if they wish. This is something that God has opened up to all of humanity. Unfortunately, though, many Christian faiths, aside from the Mormon religion, many other Christian faiths completely uh, disagree and actually condemn at the threat of excommunication generally and the threat of eternal torment mm. for many of them. They condemn the communication with spirits. This creates a lot of difficult problems. The reason why is that when people pass into the spirit world, the only form of correction they have is to talk with people on earth through a process of mediumship or communication with spirits. Mm -hmm. So if, if you've believed on earth that commu such communication is wrong and then you pass in the spirit world, you realise such communication is allowed and then you try to communicate to people who you've taught to deny you, yeah. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to communicate. The founder of the Jehovah's Witness faith is like that. Uh, Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the faith, basically taught that uh, it was wrong to communicate with spirits. When he passed into the spirit world, he, he desired to change many of the teachings that he had taught on earth, but, but the very mechanism by which he could only change these teachings was denied to him because he'd taught his own followers to, not, to deny any contact with spirits. Yeah. Now, the Mormon faith is a little different to that. 
The Mormon faith allows communication with spirits. So now we have a mechanism in the Mormon faith where spirits can learn new truths and discard old truths. The, pro the problem the faith fa faces, though, is that if they hold on to just hold on to the teachings of Joseph Smith, they will not allow the faith to grow. However, if they stop holding on to the teachings of Joseph Smith and start communicating with spirits in the spirit world, including Joseph Smith, who is now in the spirit world, and they start accurately communicating these communications to Earth, they will be able to rapidly change their faith, the truths of their faith. Mm. This could be a very, very positive effect on the Mormon religion. So the Mormon religion in some ways has a unique, uh, you know, a unique stance among Christian religions. There are, of course, other religious faiths who allow the same, but most of them will not allow the communication with darker spirits. The problem with not allowing communication with darker spirits is you can't correct the darker spirits. And I did correct the darker spirits in the first century. Secondly, um, you don't learn a lot about where the darker spirits live. And so when often you pass into those same locations, you're often very surprised. <laughs> Whereas if you'd learnt more about it, you might have had some understanding about why the spirit was in that place in the first place. The, the beauty of the Mormon faith, I feel, is that it does allow communication with spirits. And they are a little afraid of darker spirits, of course. But, uh, they, but unfortunately, they only generally communicate with spirits who are of the same faith. And this is also a problem, because when you communicate with spirits of the same faith, you are just getting the same teachings regurgitated from a different position. Mm. Yeah, and that leads to the next question, which is if what you are saying about the divine love path is true mm -hmm. and our religion which promotes priesthood ordinances as a way to God isn't bringing people closer to an, an at-one-minute state with God, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to spirits in the spirit world who are practicing Mormonism? Well, I suppose I would give advice to both spirits in the spirit world and people on earth. If we look at the advice we'd give to the spirits in the spirit world who are practicing the Mormon religion still, what I would suggest that they do is they need to ask themselves, are they at one with God even yet? Now, surely after hundreds of years of practicing the Mormon religion, or almost over 100 years of practicing the Mormon religion, they should be at one with God by now. If I became at one with God on earth in 30 years, it should be possible in the spirit world to become at one with God within a hundred years, surely. Now, if they are not at one with God yet, and they don't know what at one with God feels like or looks like, then we can easily invite a spirit to them who does know what at one with God feels like and looks like, and they can show the condition. And if they themselves are not in that condition, it is because they are holding on to things that are not true. They are holding on to unloving feelings within their soul as well. So it's an issue of truth and love and humility. So I would suggest to those spirits in the spirit world to exercise more humility and discover the things they have yet to believe and discover because they couldn't accept them before now. So in other words, they need to allow themselves to have their ideas about what is truth stretched beyond the teachings of the earth and beyond their current teachings that they have in the spirit world and accept new teachings. This is what they firstly need to do. Secondly, once they have done that, it would be fantastic if they were willing to relay that information to the people on the planet, whether they are Mormons or not. But it would be great if they could relay it to the people who are of the Mormon faith, because many people in that faith are very open to having that information relayed to them. The second thing I would do is I would advise the people on the earth still who are of the Mormon faith, and this applies, by the way, to any faith, not just the Mormon faith, to allow themselves to be open to changing their stance on their religious faith. In other words, we want to bring every religious faith into more harmony with God's laws of love. So whenever we notice that we have a teaching that is out of harmony with love, we need to change it. Whenever we notice that we have a teaching that is out of harmony with the fact that God is always loving, we need to change it. Whenever we have a, a, any idea or concept that God agrees with violence, we need to change it. And, and if we allow ourselves to go through this process of change in a humble way, 
then we'll have the spirits helping us in this process of change on the planet and the religions on earth changing very rapidly as a result. And instead of having stagnant religious systems, and if you look at most of the religious systems on earth, they have been stagnant for hundreds, if not thousands of years. We will stop having stagnant religious systems and we'll, having, we'll be having growing religious systems. Religious systems that allow for the concepts of love to be further enhanced on the planet. That's what we need. That's what we need from religion. And that's what we need from all religious faiths. From the Mormon religious faith, we have the possibility of getting it perhaps sooner than other religious faiths because of their openness to the uh, communication with spirits. But only if the spirits engage the process in a loving manner. Sure. Mm. Yeah. The final question is from myself mm -hmm. with regards to what you've just said. What would you say would be the major um, investments or the major roadblocks there would be for both spirits in the spirit world practicing certain faiths and people on earth to become open to what you've just suggested? What are the, the emotional investments that people would have in not taking that course of action? Well, darling, now we're going to have a conversation that lasts hours and hours and hours because the reality is there are so many. There are so many emotions that prevent us from accepting new truth. For example, just let, let's look at the truth of God being a loving God only, not being God of punishment, not being God of wrath or rage or anger, and that in fact love has no association with violence. Let's look at that particular belief. The majority of families on the earth are brought up in a system where violence is sometimes used in order to control a child. Because violence is sometimes used, the parent often says, I'm doing this because I love you. So there is now a direct association between love and violence established within the child. The child now has within it an emotional belief that love will accept violence. And also an emotional predisposition now to accepting that God is perhaps a violent person and can still be loving even if he is violent. Can you see just that one thing causes huge amounts of problem on the planet? And that's just one emotion. Yeah. You know, you could talk about that one emotion and its, and its underlying core problems that it creates for, for days. And this is the problem with all of the concepts that are based on Out of Harmony with Love, is that, is that many of them began in our childhood due to our, our relationship with our parents and the belief systems that our parents had. And then as a result of that, they just became more and more distorted and we then accept religious beliefs that are distorted because our own upbringing has been distorted in love. Mm. Mm. So my feelings are that there are very many emotions that mankind is going to need to work their way through honestly if they are truly going to be more accepting of new religious ideals. Oftentimes it's the non-religious persons who are more accepting of divine truth than religious persons. I might say it again, eh? Because oftentimes it is the people who are atheists, who do not have a concept of God, who are not addicted to a concept of God that's false, who are willing to see when unloving behaviour is involved on the earth and are willing to change it. And this is very sad that, that many of the religions are not leaders in love but rather our followers in love. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we go back to the thing that we opened our discussion with today, the issue of homosexuality, we can see that many religions are the last people who want to change the laws about homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Many of the people who are atheists and not, or not religious want to change the laws right now. Mm -hmm. But many of the people who are religious have no desire to change those laws at all. They are dragging the chain with regard to love, right? Just because of a religious concept that they are maintaining because they have a belief system that they are willing to give up because they don't have the humility to see that it's actually an error. So I, I believe uh, it's better, rather than talking about the different emotions that are involved, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of emotions involved in every single belief system that, that is unloving on the planet. Rather than talking about the emotions involved, perhaps what we need to mention in closing is that we need to be open to changing them. 
we need to be open to releasing these unloving emotions and the unloving beliefs. If somebody else is questioning whether something is loving, we need to have a look at it. Even if we're not open to change it, we need to have a look at it at least with some discussion. And we need to involve logic in our discussion. It is completely illogical for a person to not accept gay marriage, for example. Completely illogical. It doesn't matter what faith they have. It is completely illogical from an intellectual perspective. If it's illogical from an intellectual perspective, then it's also out of harmony with love. Mm. And we need to understand the relationship be between logic, emotions and love. Mm. You know? And so I feel that's where we need to go with religious faith on the planet. And this applies to the Mormon faith, the faith that I used to be in when I was, on Earth, when, when I was you know, here in the first century, the faith that I was, and, my, and now both of them, you know, the faith I was in before I became what I, what I am now in this life, both of those faiths have all sorts of illogical belief systems. And we need to have an ability to give them up if we're truly going to grow as a human race. Sure. Mm. Well, thank you very much. No worries. Um, Hopefully that's answered most of Caroline's questions. Yeah, and I'd like to thank Caroline. And I'd also like to say that even though I've used her questions as a guide, not everything I've expressed is her viewpoint mm. or I haven't represented her um, questions in like word for word at times. So yeah, yeah. Um, there is my inflection on this interview. But of course. thank you, Caroline, for contributing yeah. and um, for... For being questioning, I feel that's a really lovely quality. Yes, and what we'd like to do over the next few days, if we get the opportunity, is to actually start channeling some of these Mormon spirits uh, who are wanting to ask questions, and also some of the Christian spirits perhaps too, who want to ask questions in a sincere and respectful manner, yeah. um, and just address some of these underlying issues that they have with regard to their faith. Uh, because, because I feel that if we can help these spirits grow, then, then once the spirits recognise the truth, they can also help many other people on the planet to recognise the same truth. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, darling. Thanks, darling. Yeah. Thanks for being the, what would you call it, surrogate interviewer today. <laughs> Just standing. <laughs> Just standing. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Good.